March 23rd meeting of the Transportation and Circulation Committee meeting to order. Uh, and we'll start with roll call. Committee Member France. Here. Green. Hodges. Here. Horn. Here. Rodriguez. Here. Chair Blackerby. Here. Thank you. Um, and before we go to uh, public comment on items not on the agenda, I uh, want to just make note that we have a new committee member, David Hodges, and want to welcome you to the committee, and we're, we're glad to have you here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Uh, so next we'll go to public comment for items not on the agenda. I have one that seems to be on an item not on the agenda about roadway improvements in front of Moxie. Um, and then this one is, it looks like a CODA item. And then Coast, that's about number four too. Okay, so the first one would be Frank Peters. Make sure that's on the green light. Uh, great. Uh, my name is Frank Peters. Uh, I'm a new resident to Santa Barbara. This is the first time I've ever attended a Santa Barbara public meeting. First time I've stood up to speak uh, to you. I am tickled to be a Santa Barbara resident. I came from Portland, Oregon. Not a lot of people go in that direction. And of course, I knew I was giving up two things, lots of water, but that proved not to be an issue. <laughs> and I knew that Portland, a platinum bicycle city, that there was going to be a trade-off, part of the trade-off. My wife and I are trying to live a, a car-free lifestyle. That's fun. I'm at the right age. I don't have a lot of meetings across town, so I can do that. Uh, one day, we were driving down to the beach. Of course, what do you do in retirement? You drive down to the beach. And um, I encountered this intersection here. What do we call this? This is right in front of Moxie, kind yep, of. Yeah, Yana Nolly and State. Yeah, yeah. And uh, two lanes narrow to one, as you know. And what uh, startled me was it's, you know, it's new for everybody, for bike riders, for people who drive cars. Speeds didn't slow down. Motorists didn't slow down fast enough, and things get very narrow. Let me just point out a, a couple of things about this is... Uh, uh, these are hotel bicycles from one of our premier uh, hotels in town. I didn't notice that until I get home and look at the photo. Can't tell, right? And then look at the baskets. The baskets are full. So in terms of the part of Santa Barbara where we are trying to encourage tourism, uh, wow, this scores really high. Of course, in terms of safety, uh, we'd all agree that we want anybody who comes to Santa Barbara to be able to ride their bike and do so safely. I sent a letter with a few of these pictures to our public works director, and she had somebody respond to me that, of course, this has been underway for a long time, and uh, improvements still to come, and uh, you might even find green paint on the bike lane. But that didn't really satisfy me. I'm a long-term bicycle advocate, and I think what we're finding is that green paint might have been best practices some time ago, but today, much less so. Green paint isn't going to save anybody. This is a textbook example, I'd like to say, of why we want protected bike lanes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And just to clarify for the public, um, those at home or who can't see this, we're talking about the um, or our public commenter was talking about the intersection of Yananelli and State Street, and there's a new, not a refuge island, but an island uh, uh, that's been installed there That's has narrowed the roadway quite a bit. Um, okay. All right. Uh, any other public comment items not on the agenda? Okay. Um, and we'll go. Can yep. I ask a question about this, or is that out of order? Ask the question, okay. and we'll let you know. Yeah. Let you know. Um, I also <laughs> noticed that two of the people on these bicycles are not wearing helmets, and the bicycles were from a hotel. I find that interesting. I, I'm, I, it always makes me nervous when I see people in town on their bikes with no helmets, and, and it's not in, infrequent that it's um, uh, tourists. And I'd like to be caught up on what the law is about requiring people to wear helmets. 
The law is that a helmet is required if you're 16 years of age or younger, and it's not required over that age. Oh, hello, Hillary. Uh -huh. um, I have a question for the gentleman that was just speaking. Um, what is it you would like to see here, or what do you see as the problem, and how to correct it? Well, if you could go could to you, the mic, thanks. It's, uh, Thank you for your question. Uh, what would I like to see here, of course? My concern is that the uh, bike lane, or the implied bike lane, is too narrow and proximity of the cars to uh, the bicyclists, you know, proximity goes up and risk goes up accordingly. I started thinking, I shot this on a Sunday. We're down here in the funk zone. There are a lot of wine tasting, lots of opportunities for consumption of alcohol. It's probably occurring on both sides, bicyclists maybe, and either party. Uh, is uh, potentially a great risk here. What I suggested in, uh, as I was wrapping up there is uh, a curb between bicyclists, some kind of physical separation. That's what city is really leading in terms of uh, Vision Zero campaigns, is protecting bicyclists from cars with a physical separation. That's what I'd like to see. Do you see a possibility of a curb or something in this particular spot, or is that too narrow for that? I have a magic wand. I didn't bring it with <laughs> me tonight. <laughs> However, uh, I think that if we had the will, right, it, that's what it all boils down to, isn't it? If we had the political will, we could make this safe such that anybody riding their bicycle here uh, would be insulated from injury from cars. That's what it takes. Thank, Thank you, you for your question. Wish Thank you, you. would have gotten to town when we were doing our bicycle master plan. <laughs> Just a couple months late. Thank you for bringing this. Um, all right, uh, we'll move to the consent calendar, which is uh, the approval of the minutes from the November 10th and December 8th, 2016 meetings. Um, uh, so is there a motion to approve those minutes? I move to accept both minutes. Okay, Horn moves. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Um, all those, uh, is there any discussion on the minutes, anything? They are perfect, as usual. Uh, all right. All those in favor of adopting the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Minutes are adopted. All right. Moving to uh, number three, uh, MTD reports on downtown waterfront shuttle. Uh, for October, we haven't met in a while, obviously, because they're for October, November, December, January, February, uh, and also the traffic mitigation report um, for the last quarter of 2016. And we'll have uh, Steve Moss from MTD. Good evening, uh, Chair Blackerby and members of the committee. I'm here just to answer questions. I wasn't uh, preparing a for a presentation. Did anybody have any questions about those things? Yes? About the shuttle? Which item are we on? Uh, yeah, number three, the shuttle. I guess I have one question. Should I? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, every, it looks like all the um, passenger ridership is going down, and um, you did list some things of why that's happening and I just wondered do you see that continuing to to go down or to be low or? well uh, there's various elements probably to answering that question um, on the shuttle which the ridership on the shuttle is kind of independent in a sense of the ridership on the rest of our service uh, so let's talk specifically about trends we see there um, there, if you go back to 2012 was when the fare was increased and we saw starting then a fairly severe drop in ridership. And then continuing on, the, there's all the various construction projects that have been going on on lower state and that certainly has affected ridership. And, uh, and then back to uh, our general, in general, uh, not only MTD but, but transit agencies throughout the state and even throughout the nation have been seeing uh, decreases in ridership in recent years due to a, a variety of factors, low cost of gas, the availability of firms like Uber and Lyft and, and other things like that. So I don't really have a, um, 
you know, an answer for you. I can only uh, offer uh, possibilities. For example, from from uh, the, from if you look back a couple of years, from from uh, from 2015 to 2016, we had a very small decrease that year. Only the ridership decrease was one percent on the shuttles. This year, currently through February, is more. I think I want to say like seven percent on the shuttles. Uh, February was was down substantially, but that a lot of that I'm sure was the rain. I can't I can't quantify that, but I'm sure the uh, the heavy rainfall contributed to a lot of that decrease. And as for uh, what the future will bring, we'll just, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. You're welcome. I noticed that the uh, the time it takes for the shuttle to make the trip had increased from 30 minutes because of congestion to sometimes 45 minutes. And that's and that's a, been a long-term trend, of course. That um, if we go back um, 10 or 15 years, it was it was a uh, half an hour was a round trip, and now it is at certain times a day as much as 45 minutes and maybe even more on a on a summer weekend day. So yeah, that's that's contributed. We have an increased service in that time, so the so obviously there's less trips being provided because it takes longer to do each trip. So that in and of itself would reduce ridership? It certainly could if it's not running as often, people are less less likely to uh to board. Not only that, but you have um for a 2-hour period, you'd have under the previous system you'd have three trips and then with a 45 minute period you'd have two so in an hour and a half yeah yeah yes you're right so that would reduce potentially ridership by a third if I, my math's correct you know it's hard to say if it'd actually be a third but it's certainly going to reduce it just because it comes by less often and it takes longer you know if you're a fast walker you can on a summer weekend you can almost beat the shuttle but just to be to be clear, the that's not how long the headways are, right? So no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, we should. Have, yeah. It's not that it's not. It's the frequency uh, is is different than the length of time it takes to make a trip because there's more than one shuttle out on the service at a time. So a round trip for one shuttle t takes up to 45 minutes. The frequency of how often a uh, shuttle is available varies from as little as 10 minutes to as much as 20 to 25 minutes. Has the fleet remained constant during that period? The the vehicles uh, that that are used have, has remained constant uh, up from from since 1990 approximately. Um, the number of those vehicles that that MTD has available is less now than it used to be because we had to retire some of the oldest ones, and there's new vehicles uh, on order which should be here later this year. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mr. Prince. Madam Chair, if, if, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Moss, thank you so much. If I could ask a question, this may be slightly beyond the scope of this update, but uh, I'm curious, uh, especially with the update of the uh, shuttles, mm -hmm. uh, new, new funding, uh, new shuttles, uh, and um, a change in the funding structure, if uh, it might be appropriate to consider uh, briefing updates to the Downtown Parking Committee. That could certainly be uh, under, you know, could be considered, and that can be worked out between MTD and the city as to the details of that. Certainly, I think that might be helpful. I have a question, uh, additional question, which would may seem bizarre. Um, can you put bike racks on the shuttles? Well, we never have. We've got them on all the rest of our our regular urban buses. Uh, the shuttles, it would be these these shuttles that would probably not work just because they weren't designed that way. I mean, we're not planning it on the new vehicles, but it's, it could certainly be considered. I think one of the pieces is it being an you know, on-off, try to move it along as fast as possible, and we all know how fast it is to yeah. put a bike on and off the bus. I'm just but. thinking of a weary tourist who might <laughs> want to go uptown and ride down here. Totally. They do make the the vehicle considerably longer, which on a street like State Street could be a, an issue to to consider. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is number four: Coda Street Bike Lane Implementation. Mr. Prince. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I work for the Santa Barbara Bike Coalition, and we own a property nearby one of these projects. So in an abundance of caution, 
to avoid the perception of a conflict of interest, I'm going to recuse myself. Okay. Thank you very much. I won't be too far. <laughs> <laughs> but far enough as to not influence any decisions. <laughs> okay. Um, and Peter Brown and Derek Bailey will be um, jointly presenting this, uh, this item. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, Peter Brown of your staff, uh, I'm going to start off uh, with this update and then I'll hand it off to Derek, I think, for the final few slides. So in terms of the Bicycle Master Plan implementation, we wanted to talk today about a few of the projects that we think we can move towards implementing this summer. Um, as a reminder, uh, the East Side Green Lanes project and Bike Boulevard gap closure um, received $2.7 million from the state. Uh, actually, those, those funds were officially allocated um, early this year. Uh, if we look into two phases, the first phase, the one we're here to talk about today, involves implementing the Class 2 bike lanes on Coda Street. There'll be one direction uh, westbound from Milpas towards Chapala. This will be the length of the Class 2. The parking removal is, is much less than that. We're, we're looking at the focus of the parking removal being between Salsa Puedes and Santa Barbara Street. When you move beyond Santa Barbara Street towards Chapala, uh, we have enough uh, roadway width to accommodate the bike lanes without impacting parking. The larger project, uh, which would be the green laning of Coda and Haley Street and the building of the Alisos Bike Boulevard, is dependent upon the state's allocation of those ATP funds. So that's still a few years away. <coughs> As a reminder, we also have some supplementary uh, funds from the local Measure A. Uh, this will be our conflict striping project. I in discussing things with Mr. Dayton and Mr. Bailey and some of our other staff, it, it looks like due to our accidents uh, collision record, what we want to focus on is Lower State Street for this project in terms of the spine network. Uh, we do have flexibility to connect to the spine, and so Coda Haley, Mitchell Terrena, SOLA connections to the bike boulevards are also eligible for these funds. But I believe Mr. Bailey is seeking a new staff member who will be charged with the design of this project here in the coming months. So we will keep you updated as that progresses forward. I also, uh, our team updated you all uh, last fall on kind of the near term projects. This is that list updated with what we know today. Uh, the Haley class two is just one block uh, that connects De Lavina and Chapala. Uh, the Rancheria Class 2s, uh, something that we're looking to do this summer if possible as well. The Castillo Contraflow, Bath Castillo Couplet Extension, and the De Lavina Class 2s involve a little bit more funds and potential roadway uh, improvements. So those uh, are yet to be determined, but I put some potential fiscal years when we could get those on the ground. And the Ortega Class 2s between Santa Barbara Street and Quarantina Street actually r right here above where we're sitting uh, right now is something that we haven't decided quite yet when we're going to implement them. There's a small chance it could be done this summer as well if uh, our overlay funds allow. So we're doing some street overlays. And this is kind of, when we do these restriping projects, just remember it really makes sense for us to um, incorporate them with pavement maintenance so that um, the project costs can be rolled in. <clears throat> Just a reminder uh, for the, the core of this network, this is the West Side Bike Boulevard, the Mitchell Train of Green Lane Connection, the Sola Bike Boulevard. Of course, you see the spine network there with State Street and uh, the upper ends of Chapala and De Lavina. The two green bars that connect over there to the east side and the lower uh, part of the map is, Ch uh, is Haley and Coda. Uh, and you can see kind of the, the gaps in the network that are going to be closed with the bike Uh, this is a, a slide straight out of the Bicycle Master Plan, uh, and <coughs> it kind of reminds uh, well, all of us where we uh, had council adopt the parking removals. So this is the extent and the locations of those. <coughs> the Coda Haley Street <coughs> Green Lanes was a project that was a pretty high priority as we ranked these projects. So this is the what we call the cut sheet that summarizes the project. Uh, 
Uh, and then the description there, just to read the first sentence or so, the, the Coda Street project uh, entails converting one parking lane on Coda Street to westbound bicycle lane. So that's that's kind of the impetus of what we wanted to let your commission as well as the neighborhood know that uh, if funds are available, uh, we would uh, pursue that this summer. <clears throat> These are a couple of the plans that show the Aliso Spike Boulevard and some of those improvements. And then of course the Hoda, Coda Haley Green Lanes connecting to the bike boulevard. And in this particular case, you can see the direction of the bike lanes for Haley, Coda, and then the Ortega Class 2s, which we had not anticipated um, to get green paint. Uh, and then in terms of the one-way analysis, one of the things that we were asked by the community uh, in an attempt to um, uh, preserve on-street parking was to, was to study what would happen if we converted Coda to a one-way street. Uh, and at this point, I was going to turn it over to Mr. Bailey to kind of walk you through uh, that analysis and our conclusions from it. Thank you. Good evening, committee members. My name is Derek Bailey. I'm with the Public Works Department as well in the uh, Traffic Engineering Group. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, as Peter mentioned, we were, um, as, as the bike master plan was being developed and a lot of community discussion was going on and as to how do we get the best possible projects within the city? Uh, when, when the discussion came to Coda Street, one of the suggestions that came up was, well, have you looked at turning Coda into a one-way street as a way to minimize parking removal? And, um, you know, in, in the spirit of trying to get the best possible projects, we, we looked into that. And uh, w when you do a study of trying to figure out whether or not you can turn a street into one way or not, there are traffic impacts. And so we have to figure out whether or not um, those traffic impacts are acceptable or not. And, and, you know, and if they are, then the conversation can continue as to whether or not it's a good idea to do. So uh, the, the first step towards that uh, was we uh, hired our, a consulting firm that does a lot of work for the city doing traffic modeling, kind of long range projections. And they have an electronic traffic model built and they can uh, manipulate the model in such a way that they can change streets from one way to two way, two way to one way, back and forth, and they can see how that traffic filters through the network with the changes. And uh, so that's kind of the first brush approach that we, we take at that. And that, that study cost the city about $5,000 to do with the, with the consultant, but uh, we thought it was well worth it just to make sure that the, we got the best possible project on Coda Street. Um, th this table here, I, w I won't go into much detail, but it just shows if we change Coda from a two-way street to a one-way street, where's that traffic going to divert to? Um, <clears throat> This, this graphically represents what those changes are. So if you'll uh, just bear with me, I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, Coda Street is in red right here. And just to the south of it is Haley Street, Gutierrez Street below that, and uh, De La Guerra up here. Uh, we, we tried a number of different scenarios because we, we weren't quite sure... Um, where exactly would be the best place to start and end the, the one-way street. Um, I, should, I should say to end it. As a starting point, it made a lot of sense to start at Aliso Street, where the bike boulevard is, and that way you could get a bike lane right to the bike boulevard facility. But in terms of how far west would it continue, um, we, we weren't quite sure. So we, we had our consultant model a number of different scenarios. One was at Salsa Puede Street. That's where the one-way street would end. Or another scenario would be, what if you took it all the way to Santa Barbara Street? And so what, what this shows here is the Santa Barbara Street um, scenario. And the red indicates that traffic is decreasing on a street. Green indicates traffic is increasing, more traffic on the street. So a as would be expected, uh, CODA sees a significant drop in traffic because now there's only one direction of traffic as opposed to two. So you'd, you'd expect roughly half the traffic to go away. So all that traffic heading from downtown back to the east side, where does it go? That's, that's the question. So uh, you can see a lot of traffic uh, uses Haley Street. Um, a lot of traffic uses De La Guerra Street. And what surprised us that we weren't quite expecting was 
how traffic got through the east side neighborhood up to Alameda Padre Serra, APS. Um, and you can see these green lines here. This is Gutierrez Street going through the east side, and this is De La Guerra Street going through the east side. Uh, those will both see a pretty significant increase in traffic volumes. Uh, can you tell me where Milpas is? The names are so little. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time. So this thin line right here okay. is Milpas Street. So. Uh, everything over here where I'm floating my mouse over right now, that's the, that's the east side. Uh, historically, we've had complaints about traffic volumes and traffic speeds on both De La Guerra Street and Gutierrez Street. So this was a big red flag to us when uh, we saw that uh, there'd be a pretty significant traffic diversion. You know, Coda Street would obviously be a winner because traffic volumes would go down. De La Guerra and Gutierrez would, would both be losers, and um, we uh, we we didn't think this project, uh, as modeled here, would be viable for that reason. Um, as well, even though the the thickness of this green line it, it represents a proportional increase, uh, doesn't seem that large on Haley Street, especially in the vicinity of Garden Street. Uh, that's an intersection that's teetering on the brink of being at capacity right now. So any additional traffic that we try to push through that intersection um, would create congestion. So um, this scenario didn't, uh, um, wasn't one that we moved, decided to move forward with. Um, another possible scenario that we thought of is, well, in order to mitigate the impacts of uh, one-way Coda Street on Haley Street so that we don't send more traffic down Haley, what if we turn part of Gutierrez Street back to a one-way street? We know that Gutierrez, <coughs> back to a two-way street. I'm sorry. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we know that east of Salsa Puede Street, where Salsa Puede is, turns into Calle Cedar Chavez, um, between there and Milpa Street, Gutierrez Street actually isn't that busy of a street, and uh, uh, one lane could handle the eastbound traffic, but... Um, what we found here is that so much traffic would try to use Gutierrez uh, that it would overload that one lane street and it would even um, exaggerate the amount of traffic trying to use Gutierrez Street uh, to get up to APS on the east side. So as well, we, did, we didn't see that as a viable alternative either. Uh, Derek, well, um, can you back up? Um, you don't show, Haley I know it dead ends, but it's interesting to me that there, there's, do they just stop at Milpas, even though Haley goes a few more blocks? Car, the, they're just not flowing up that way. They right. go to the main arteries at Milpas. Right, and that, that, that's <clears throat> partially to do with the way the model is put together and the links that mm -hmm. the, the traffic um, model used. Um, there probably is some traffic that would filter through on Haley, uh, but because Haley doesn't go through to APS, where a lot of the traffic is trying to get to, uh, that traffic is going to try to get over to Gutierrez Street and De La Guerra Street. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for that question. Mr. Are there problems, um, Derek, on Garden going to be there regardless or need their own mitigation, despite uh, whether one way or two way, um, couplet or no? Right. There, there are. Uh, congestion-related issues on Garden Street from Haley, and particularly once you get down to Gutierrez Street and the interchange. Um, like I said, it, it, Haley Street is kind of teetering on the uh, edge of um, what we would classify as a congested intersection right now, so uh, any additional trips that we send through that intersection, um, once you get to capacity, then that's when queues really start building. Uh, the only way out of that is to expand the size of the intersection, and it's a built-up intersection on every corner, so that would be a, a, a really expensive project, and we, we don't even know if the community has an appetite for um, that kind of roadway expansion. Uh, so we're, we're, we're really trying to be careful with how we configure our roadways that we, we don't send additional trips through that intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Bailey or Mr. Brown? Would you go, would you show the first option again so I can kind of Absolutely. think about it? Okay. Um, and just to clarify for for the public and for um, committee members that 
this isn't an action item uh, today, but that we're just, you know, updating because, of course, these were things that were adopted as part of our <laughs> long, 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 massive outreach plan um, that came with the Bicycle Master Plan. So I just want to clarify that. Um, well, yeah. But they're getting ready to put in to do it this summer, part of it. Exactly. Right? Okay, that's the, not long range. That's this is a potential summer. project. No, that's what I'm saying. The, it's not an action. We're not, today we're not going, <coughs> shall we or shall we not type thing. That'll that come in sense. a few months. That came. That decision was year. made with city council when we adopted the bicycle master plan. Oh, got but it. But we did tell council at the time we adopted, adopted it that we were doing this study to see if it was feasible to put in the one way, <coughs> one way portion to prevent or lessen the amount of on-street parking that would be removed. So this is an information item to share with the committee. We've also noticed uh, business owners and property owners along the corridor so they can be aware of, of the findings of the study. Right. So the decision on exactly how the lanes are going to be done hasn't been made yet? Whether you're going to do one way or two way? It has been made. Right. We're going to remove parking on Coda as the plan prescribes. Uh, but we told council we would, at, at the request of the public, do the study that you just saw uh, to see if, if one way in CODA would be beneficial and actually improve things so that we didn't have to do the removal of parking. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It was very confusing to me, obviously. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah. So the, you know, the council empowered staff to move forward with, um, you know, green lanes on CODA, but... First, to check the feasibility of one way in CODA right. failing the feasibility moving now, forward. Now and, I understand. Yeah. So we're leaving it two way, just putting in eliminating parking spaces, and you were just showing us the backup as to how we got there. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And committee members, I just want to emphasize you know, it's just kind of like one of those uh, only in Santa Barbara, you know. Uh, you know, a, 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 oftentimes in my career of 25 years, uh, a member of the public will make a great suggestion. Much of the bicycle master plan was guided by the public, so we ha heard this great idea. We we went after it. It, it was it was a it was a really good idea. We spent the money. Fortunately, we have a traffic model uh, to to conduct that work. So 5,000 is is a lot, but less than we would if we were starting from square one. Um, we're just disappointed with the results. Um, so, uh, we can go to public comment. Is that cool? Yes. Is, do you have anything else? No, that's okay. all. I have Thank one you. question. Um, does that mean there will be bike lanes on either side or on one side only as a couplet with the bike lanes on Haley or the bike lane on Haley? There will be just one bike lane. It will be a, a westbound bike lane, so it will be running along the north side of the street. Thank you. And then uh, in addition to that, there will be another couplet that we're creating on Ortega Street uh, that will head back towards the junior high. That will be on the south side of the street. So there will actually be two lanes heading east on Haley and Ortega and then the one lane heading west. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. So we'll go to public comment. I have one, two, three, four, five speaker slips. If um, anyone else would like to speak on this item or any of the items after, um, please do put in in one. Um, first, I have John McCormick, followed by Joanna Kaufman. Hey, Madam Chair, Council. I am the resident at 710 East Coda, in front of the junior high school, where you're proposing to put in the bike lane. I see you have a lot of extra lawn in front of the school and the park that the bike lane could be moved onto the property of the park and the school and not into the street to save space for the bike lane, make it safer for the bicyclists off the road and then bring them back in to the lane a little further down and saving parking space. Because if you've ever been in front of the high school or the junior high, and they, all these companies park their cars there there's no parking I can't park in front of the house all this stuff and then the children's parents come in to pick up they're all parking at the red curb in the bike lane that you're proposing to put in there you're gonna have no place for the kids to be picked up 
So I think that if we could get the bike lane off the highway and make it more safer, as the gentleman was saying, we'd get it out of the traffic lane, safer for the bikers and so on. I would like to see it. And if you decide to not go that way, I'd like to see implementing resident parking stickers for the pr people who are on the coda that will leave the businesses that take up all the parking to find, make them park in their lots because there's a lot of lots that they don't use because they make their employees park off street, I mean on the street. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to be clear, mm -hmm. generally we, uh, sorry, it was just to the whole, thank you. Um, uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes. Generally we don't have this many speakers, so we're a little more lax, but just so we're not here forever. But um, thank you. Uh, Joanna Kaufman to be followed by Cameron Gray. Hello. Um, my name is Joanna Kaufman, and I am program director for the Coalition uh, for Sustainable Transportation, which is also known as COAST. And um, I appreciate the implementation of the bike lanes. Um, I know it's as approved um, in the bicycle master plan. I know they had to do this additional study, and it's appreciated um, that staff went through and is now giving us an up update of what they found. Um, a, the loss of parking lanes will be an inconvenience for some, but the net benefit to our overall community um, will provide additional safe routes to school and for people that are commuting between the east side um, to the uh, jobs downtown. So we support any efforts to connect the bicycle network across town and um, also to remember that the more people that ride to work in town, the less congestion that and traffic there will be for cars. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Cameron Gray to be followed by Joey. Damn it, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like I, I'm pretty sure I know how to pronounce it, but I'm, I'm not going to make a fool of myself. Go ahead, Cameron. Chair Blackerby and Commission members, good evening. My name is Cameron Gray, speaking on behalf of Community Environmental Council. Uh, we recognize the loss of uh, 76 parking spaces for the three different projects that we've discussed here tonight will present some real hardships for certain members of our community. And while we do our best to minimize the negative impacts uh, of the affected individuals, we must also continue to acknowledge that these bike lanes will serve thousands of Santa Barbara residents who ride their bike well into the future. <clears throat> We're encouraged to see the city moving forward with low-cost improvements to the bike network less than a year after the Bicycle Master Plan update was adopted by City Council. Uh, our nonprofit sent staff down to Riverside along with members of other organizations like SB Bike uh, to speak in support of the 7.7 .7 million ATP award to the City of Santa Barbara. Given the timeline for dispersing these funds and the narrow window it will leave for implementation of the projects, we commend city staff for their foresight in moving forward with this uh, Coda Street project and other projects. Completing elements of these projects um, now will help ensure that none of that money is left on the table. So we very much are supportive of that move. Um, and lastly, just want to say that, you know, we're continue to, to stand behind the city as they look at other projects in the future. Um, we want to make sure that you can continue supporting the growth of active transportation in the community because that's really going to benefit everyone here and the rest of the world as we reduce emissions. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Joey to be followed by Sebastian Aldana, Jr. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joey Juhas Lukomsky, uh, and I'm here on behalf of the Santa Barbara Bicycle Coalition. And uh, we're very excited to see projects uh, approved in the Bike Master Plan being implemented within a year of that approval. Uh, the Coda Street project is so important because it closes uh, an enormous bike lane gap in the system, and that is the return trip from the uh, east side. So Haley, as we all know, can get you to the east side on a bike, whereas... Um, and there's no clear way back, no clear return trip. And uh, it's, we feel that this is one of those projects that's really going to make that move towards the mode share goal set in the bike master plan. Um, it's a project that will be great for people that are already riding their bikes in the city. But this kind of connection is one that's going to get 
more folks riding their bikes, people that weren't riding their bikes before uh, out on the streets, I believe. So that's working towards that goal set in the bicycle master plan. Um, uh, I want to echo Coast's comments about it uh, being a safe route to school and connecting to the Santa Barbara Middle School. And um, I'd also like to say that I think this is the kind of project that will alleviate some of the concerns about people on their bikes being scoff laws um, or maybe not obeying the law because it'll, working on Haley Street, I see a lot of people riding the wrong way in the bike lane on Haley Street and I feel like if there's a clear connection there for them to take on CODA, that will reduce uh, that problem. And I just wanna say I'm very excited um, for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Sebastian Haldana Jr. to be followed by Michael Manassi. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Sebastian Haldana Jr., Eastside resident and also a uh, Coda Street um, resident. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all um, who took into consideration of making Coda Street a one way. Great idea, bad results. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am glad uh, the bike lane is off the junior high lawn and, and the park lawn, or even the parkway for that matter, as uh, uh, th there was suggestion at one time. Uh, but my concern is the, the 600 block and the 700 block of East Coda, you know, being that we're losing parking, uh, maybe a solution can be uh, to make the 600 block of uh, Quarantina Street a street again. Um, right now it's lawn, it, that's in between the Ortega Park and, and um, the junior high. Uh, a few months back on the 700 block and the 800 block of Quarantina, uh, the Creeks Department, they, they installed uh, permeable pavers. Mm -hmm. um, right now they're getting 2% of the TOT. Uh, I think they're doing pretty good. They're buying adjacent uh, property to the Creeks. So maybe they can pay for that uh, one block show their appreciation of all the tax money that they're receiving. <laughs> so, that, um, and then also, it was my understanding that the bike lane cannot be placed on the park if it's not a park amenity. So that's the reason why it's, or one of the reasons why it's not on the park. Uh, that's it, but uh, please uh, take into uh, some serious consideration of Quarantina Street and also for Creeks to, to pay for that. Thank you. Thank and thanks you. for being the one who had that great idea to look at one-way coda. More than I welcome. remember. Okay. <laughs> All right, Michael Manassi to be followed by Lori Lariva. Good evening, committee members. My name is Michael Manassi. I'm the owner of an apartment building at 415 Rancheria Street. Uh, it's classified by the city as a legal non-conforming building. It's got 16 bedrooms and six parking spaces. And most of my tenants are not students. They're local, millenni they're young millennials uh, with local jobs that need cars to get to work. So just by process of mathematics, um, at least eight, eight of my tenants on a daily basis use those parking spots on Rancheria Street at night. Um, Rancheria, as you know, is right one block away from City College, so it has a little bit different dynamic than, um, than some of these other streets. During the day, uh, um, on school days, it's completely jammed with students parking. Um, and uh, at night, the streets are very crowded with residents. I urge the committee to look at some other alternatives. Um, it, than taking away the parking spaces, maybe allow them at night. I don't know what the dynamics are between say a class two or class three bike lane. Um, one other suggestion one of my tenants made was to make a resident only parking area because all this parking, all the street parking is taken up by students during the day. So Rancheria has a lot different dynamic than many of the other streets uh, on the bike lane uh, uh, agenda. So I hope you take that into consideration um, when making that decision because there's a lot of different impacts that, um, that that street has that the others don't. Thank you. Lori Lariva to be followed by Michael Montenegro. 
Good evening, Chair Black Ruby and committee members. My name is Lori Lariva, and I live on the east side, east of Milpa Street, and for many years have traveled by bike on Coda, which I love because it's quite level and calm on the weekends, and I'm able to take the lane and stay out of the door, out of the door zone. Um, I also live near Canon Perdido, but I frequently don't take that bike lane because it is so close to the parked cars. So the one concern I have with the Coda Street new bikeway to be put in place would be that it not be in a door zone, um, at least not in the driver's door zone. And so I know it's going to look different on different blocks of Coda, but for the stretches where it will run adjacent to parking to find a way to have it spaced differently. And I know some regions put bikeways as opposed to on the left side of parking, on the right side of parking. So something to basically consider the door zone issue would be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Michael Montenegro to be followed by Betsy Spalding. Uh, good evening, buenas tardes. Hi, um, I would like to introduce, introduce myself as a college student. I live in the west side and I go to a city college. I, I'm a working class individual, I'm a dad. Uh, I depend on my bicycle and for me the Rancheria Street as a bike lane would make my commute and all, a lot of my other colleagues and my classmates uh, more accessible to go to City College because I live all the way by La Cumbre Junior High and in going to City, City College is a straight away. So with the Chino Boulevard being implemented then um, now with the Rancheria it will just make uh, safety a lot more uh, accessible. And I just love, uh, I'm just all for making bicycling more accessible because uh, one of the biggest things I hear is just folks, the reason why folks are not cycling enough is because they don't feel it's uh, accessible enough. So let's make more bike lanes and let's make cycling more accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Betsy Spaulding and then Ben Kropp. Betsy Spaulding. I've lived in Santa Barbara over 30 years and I've used my bike most of that time to get downtown and to work in Carpinteria as often as possible. I also drive when I need to. Um, but I also use Haley often to get over to the east side and I'm looking forward to a way to get back from the east side on a bike path because it's a little concerning, I would say, on a bike. And so I really look forward to the Coda bike lane and look forward to its implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben Kropp and then <laughs> the one I'm being handed right now. <laughs> and then Ann Micah, Micah, something. A good evening, committee members. First of all, uh, thank you for listening to all these comments on this bike lane. I understand this is not an action item and you'll not be voting on anything today, but I still want to vote, uh, voice my public support in what you're doing. Um, my name is Ben Kropp. I am a professor at Santa Barbara City College, and I see a lot of bikes going to and from the college. In fact, at any given time, there are around 500 bicycles parked on campus, which, dis which is to say it is the most biked to location in all of the city. So that is why I think Rancheria specifically is such an important connection to make. And so you may hear comments in opposition to it, but I want you to hold your ground as the vote was made because uh, as some of our students have even said today, that it is a really important connection because there's currently no safe way to get to City College from the west side, zero, absolutely none. And the 12, 25 parking spaces that are gonna be removed, I understand a number of them have already been found in other places. So to keep it short, Thank you so much for continuing with this project and make Rancheria a safe pl place for all of my students to come. Oh, and one more thing, the idea of uh, parking on Rancheria, it's our goal at City College that to get more people to bike to campus and walk and commute, commute that therefore fewer people will have to park off campus because more parking spaces will become available on campus. So that's our hope by opening up Rancheria. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, I actually, I, I called out Ann, uh, is next, but that's for item number five. But Jeff Grow, is that on this item? Yeah. Okay, yeah. come on up. Good 
Good evening. My name is Jeff Crow. I live on Garcia Road, and I live downtown. I'm sorry, I work downtown, and I'm some in support of the Coda Street bike lanes. Um, I often take the, the Cannon Perdido bike lanes, and they are a little congested with the high school traffic, so I am hope you consider the Coda Street bike lanes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing no other public comment on item number four, um, it's back to the committee, uh, and I want to see if Mr. Dayton, if you had any thing right away. Yeah, well, I just the one uh, commenter, um, John McCormick. I just want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate his great idea for putting the, the the bike lane off onto the park and in front of the school. And in fact, that was our first proposal. Uh, that this most of the committee members are familiar with that. Um, it turns out that we couldn't do that because it's parkland, and the city attorney said we couldn't actually put it in the in the on the grass because of the parkland. Um, and I believe that's the case for uh, Quarantina Street. I think it's been turned over to parkland as well. And then, but aside from all that, when we did the numbers to get the grant, one of the things we found, and I think that you'll all remember this, is that that added expense to do that to do an off street class one facility actually made uh, the cost benefit ratio not good enough to get the funds. So we're pretty confident we would not have gotten the grant if we included that element into the project. So, and then in reference to the, um, the drop off, that is, as you point out, that's very unfortunate. Um, but the drop off, the drop off is only in the morning and the, in the evening that will continue in the bike lane and there'll be an option for people to go on the sidewalk. Um, but it's only for those two times on school days. Okay. All right, we we don't have any back and forth, but it's taken. So anyway, um, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, to thank you. Um, so questions, comments from the committee? I have a comment mm -hmm. um, and a question, I guess. Uh, is it possible for that apartment building that has no not enough parking on Rancheria, is it possible to get uh, permits for that area for the residents? Thank you, uh, Committee Member Horn. That's, uh, that's another thing I was hoping to bring up that I forgot. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, it's called the Residential Parking Permit Program, and I think this was brought up for both the Rancheria area and for the Coda area. And both of those programs are in play, and that takes uh, a certain number of your residents to request that at downtown parking. Uh, we have areas in other neighborhoods besides downtown. One of them is the Mesa, Area M. So in the Rancheria area, it would be an expansion of Area M. And for the code, it would be a new area. But the, all the requirements for that program um, and getting your neighbors together to request that are available at downtown parking offices. Great. Other comments? Yes. And, and I want to welcome our other committee member, Mr. Green. Ford's here. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, my... Um, Daughter and son-in-law live on Gutierrez, so I was, that's why I was asking a lot of questions about that. Um, it's, it's a very problematic street. They live on the last block just before APS, and people use that as a, a highway. I mean, they go 40 miles an hour in a 25-mile zone. So um, I think um, I'm very pleased that, um, I'm sorry that the analysis didn't work out, but I'm really glad you're not going to do anything to increase traffic on Gutierrez because traffic on Gutierrez is really bad right now between APS and Milpas. And um, I'm well aware that the residents there have, have requested um, uh, speed bumps and signs for children, and I know many people in the city are requesting those things of uh, of, of your department, but I'm looking right at Derek and smiling. <laughs> if anything can be done on Upper Gutierrez, uh, because there's a number of small children that live up there, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be much appreciated. Um, and one thing that, an, another question to address, and maybe Derek, you wanna do this, but the discussion, because we didn't really talk about what's, parking's not being removed the whole way right so if you could address the sort of door zone question um yeah as to where that's all going to be chair lockerby um yes the uh the configuration of the bike lane uh from milpas over to 
um, State Street. Do we have a good map, Peter? I can find one. We're really going to take a block by block approach to the uh, the bike lanes on Coda Street. And, and the reason is block by block, there's different land uses. You know, as you're over by the junior high, there's um, residents and businesses along the south side. So it makes sense that's where we want to preserve parking. You know, as you get across Salsa Puedes, uh, there's the MTD frontage on one side and then there's businesses on the other. So it makes sense to flip on that side and keep the bar parking next to businesses. Um, so it's going to kind of move back and forth as we as we go down the, the street. Uh, we are planning on minimizing the amount of blocks where um, the bike lane is next to parked cars. I think we're looking about a block and a half out of the nine blocks. Uh, so for the rest of the corridor, uh, parking will, mo or uh, uh, the bike lanes will mostly be next to the curb. And in those cases, we might even have space along there that we can paint in some buffers uh, to improve uh, safety and rider comfort. Um, so, so it really is going to be a, a block by block um, okay. customization. And and what what's the size of the bike? If you could just talk about, I mean, obviously block by block would be different, but generally, just for the public's benefit, the width of a bike lane and and where it is in in conjunction to to the shoulder. And Minimum standards are five feet. Uh, I expect along this corridor we'll be able to provide at, le at least six feet um, and likely a two to three foot buffer in places as well. Great. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Green. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I have a question that came up in, in this last discussion about the parking, residential parking permits. Would some action by this committee facilitate uh, doing that or does it have to depend on the residents petition the the committee wouldn't have any influence over that it's set up by ordinance by residents and the process is in place so yeah if there was you know, something that helped i could i could prompt you <laughs> but it actually doesn't exist good question Rodriguez. Yeah, I just want to make a comment on the Rancheria issue. I, I, we discussed this at length in the past, and um, it is extremely unfortunate that that is a highly impacted area and that um, it, you, we have to lose parking. But I would really like to emphasize that I know of two people that have fractured pelvises from falling in un, going under the Castillo under, underpass because that was the only place available and they wanted and I the young man with the beard who spoke earlier I'm uh, I'm sure you know the route I'm talking about I got to get to school I, I'm going to take Castillo so um, although it's pretty well marked uh, I think there's I, I, I think there have been a number of accidents there so that's why um, some inconvenience for Rancheria I think I just want to point out that we're trying to avoid very, very serious bike accidents. So it's a it's a tough situation. I just want that on the record. Thank you. Other questions or comments on this item on Coda, Haley, Rancheria? I would just like to follow up. Um, understand, Mr. Dayton, that we can't, uh, that ordinance covers the parking permits, but if there could be some help given to residents of an area to help themselves organize so as to begin permit a permit process which they may not know how to do that would be helpful because not all neighborhoods are as effectively organized uh, and would be an opportunity for them to do so we'll, we'll hand I'll hand a couple business cards out and we'll I'd be happy to help Thanks. thank you very much other comments or questions well, I just want to uh, Thank staff for moving so quickly on this. Um, I know the bike plan process felt long, um, but we knew, you know, that's kind of the point of a master planning process that we we plan and then we can execute the projects as as they're funded. So um, it's exciting to see. I'm I'm excited to uh, write on all these um, as they're um, definitely in areas that I frequent a lot. So. Um, very exciting can't wait to see and when the first green paint goes on the road or once it has I think probably everyone here would like to be uh, invited to 
watch it go down. So, um, or maybe I'm just a dork who would want to see those things. So, um, <laughs> uh, all right. So um, we don't have to take any action. We uh, have one more um, add-on item to this. We're bearing gifts. So Pe this one? Okay. Yeah. Peter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dayton, Chair Blackerby, members of the committee. We do not often get to thank you with physical uh, material goods, but today uh, we, this is the last bike related item we have. We're going on to other topics. Uh, and I do have hard copies of the Bicycle Master Plan. You all put in more hours probably than you thought it would take <laughs> in terms of meetings at this committee. Many of you, in fact, all of you, I think, came to our public meetings at some point or another. And so on behalf of the entire transportation division and the Public Works Department, uh, we want to thank you for all your hard work, and I'll present uh, the hard copies to you now. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> wow, we've never had a ceremony here. <laughs> thank you very much. I guess that gets one. Beautiful, thank you. This is a limited and, and if, limited edition. Yeah, and all if, other copies will be on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and if if you're still, uh, though our contract with them ran out a long time ago, um, if you're still in touch with the, the consultants that helped, please do pass along uh, our thanks uh, for this. And it it looks mighty fine too. So, um, thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on and great and. Um, Ms. Rodriguez had a great segue about broken pelvises, and so we'll move on to number five, uh, which is uh, US 101 Castillo Interchange Pavement Improvements. I knew, I knew that. We, we, didn't, we didn't pay her for that comment. Yeah, but, good. But that was actually an amazing uh, segue. Yeah, so we would like to talk about, um, among other things, broken pelvises. And in the uh, Castillo 101 interchange, just to give you a little idea about this interchange and its importance to our community, um, it's located uh, right here in the turn, uh, right here in the turn of the 101, right here, and uh, Castillo is right here, and uh, City College is is right up here, and so that is one of the major. Uh, destinations but also the entire Mesa the entire Mesa has uh, three access points and Montecito to the Castillo interchange cliff drive to Montecito to the, to the Castillo interchange uh, provides uh, one of those access points it's a very critical interchange to get to the waterfront as well and just uh, blowing it up a little bit there's some things that are different about this interchange than others uh, this was actually constructed in 1961, so it's our first interchange. Notice that the, the northbound off-ramp gets off on Bath, which is a little different, so it doesn't go directly to Castillo. Uh, there's also some very interesting things about the, the ramp. Uh, Haley is very short in getting here. Uh, Castillo's coming um, down here. This is actually two-way, but turns into one-way beyond Coda. Um, it's got the railroad crossing here and then the waterfront uh, down below. Just getting into the interchange and looking at it, uh, very substandard in terms of uh, lane widths, in terms of bicycle lane widths, in terms of uh, sidewalk widths, which uh, in addition to being um, not as wide uh, up against a, a wall. So uh, and, and a lot of our interchanges are, are, are older in the community, and so they don't have the the standards, and, and this is uh, no exception. One, we want to call attention to what's been happening since 1961 is that this actually, when it originally, this interchange originally went in, it's uh, below the water table. It's actually constructed below the water table. And unlike Garden Street, which is also, the interchange is below the water, the water table, and so is State Street on a crossing. Though both of those are below the water table. This one leaks, and it's actually leaked since um, uh, very early, the, 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 the slab seal cracked very early in its uh, construction, after its construction, so it's been leaking for quite some time. Um, yeah, we're up to 60 years almost. Uh, and this leak has been a challenge for the interchange in that the presence of water causes a, a major safety hazard for, for everybody who's using 
who's using this uh, interchange. Uh, the, primar the primarily one who's getting injured is the cyclist. Although uh, pedestrians have been injured, there are many rear end collisions. The, the water produces a, a slippery, um, a slippery uh, surface. And Caltrans has done many, many different things to try to fix it. Uh, the first of which is that I remember, if you, if you just see in this picture, you see a little, you see a little grate right here. That's a, that's a wall slot grain to try to catch the leaks that happen from the walls. Um, but it then started leaking in the street. They, the last one they did was some pavers. They tried pavers. They tried electrolysis. They tried all sorts of different things. Um, but it has not been able to be fixed. Uh, so while um, this is, a, this is a actually showing some of the history, we, this is Caltrans provided uh, information. I'm sorry, it's very small. But, uh, but this provides some of the history of what the projects that Caltrans has done over time and the money they've spent. The last one that they're proposing for June of 2017 uh, is to redo the surface and, and suspend the surface over a space so that, the, so that the water can percolate up into that space and then hopefully drain, uh, sheet drain off of it. Um, the challenge we've had over time is that between the amount of time that the water, the community has to have had experienced the water on the surface, which is very frequently over that 60 years, and then the construction and the cost to, and disruption to traffic to actually fix those times has been, if you add up all the, all the experience plus the safety and the collisions and the injuries, it's a really big tax and expense on our community. And so while we do applaud uh, Caltrans for trying to, again, fix it, um, what we're asking and what we'd like to do, and this is going to be the recommendation, is that council would send a letter uh, to Caltrans requesting that the planning for the permanent replacement of the entire interchange uh, start begin today uh, without delay. So it takes a long time, it's per perhaps a decade, to do that kind of planning and, and to save the money to do a, a permanent replacement. But that's what we're requesting. Um, the collisions since the last project uh, have uh, doubled. Uh, we have, um, this is just a collision record from January uh, 2015 to 2017. So you can see five bicyclists and three pedestrians involved. Uh, we think there's many more unreported collisions um, that, do, you know, they go un unreported. And uh, most of them are around the southbound ramps, but twice as many collisions as were before the pavers. Caltrans has actually put up signs that say don't, bicycles shouldn't use the interchange, which while we understand why that's important uh, and to keep safe, uh, it's also um, a very needed interchange for cycling. So that's, again, another disruption. This is just some of the scenes that have become a little bit too common in the interchange as uh, cyclists are going down and being hit by cars or just falling just uh, because of the slippery and the, uh, the pavers which are loose. Here's a, here's a cluster of the collisions that have occurred just recently. You can kind of see where they're happening. This is, the, this is what we see and we can kind of see a little bit about the detail of each one of those collisions without going through them all, but what we see on the computer when we look at the, the data record of the collisions. The pedestrian volumes in this interchange are pretty high relative to the rest of the city. It's one of the higher locations. If you see the orange uh, and the red, as, as you get, it's kind of a heat map as you get hotter and redder. So you can see down in that area where it is on the orange side right here. Um, uh, peak hour bike lanes. This is a very hot area through this area for bikes. So again, it's very critical to have this interchange made whole. Uh, and then, and then motorists uh, in into the future. The, uh, and now, this interchange is the existing level of service is level of service D for the southbound ramps, and uh, and C for uh, the northbound in the PM peak hour. This is projected to just get worse. So again, um, just moving to the recommendation, of course, to hear the presentation. But uh, we'd like to have your recommendation for city council to. To, and we would uh, author a letter and present it to city council with your recommendation. Uh, uh, 
petitioning Caltrans and saying, hey, really appreciate you're doing this fix again, but we really need a solution that's permanent. And, and now that we're now we're fixing an outdated interchange. So back to the committee, we'd be happy to any, answer any questions you have. Okay, um, take questions and then we have um, three public comment slips. Yeah, Mr. Franz. Uh, thank you, Chair Blackerby. Uh, Mr. Dayton, my first, my, my question is, is the scope of this project limited to under the uh, bridge of the 101, or would it extend on either end, uh, for example, uh, south towards the ocean to Montecito Street, to that intersection, which is also the juncture with you know, Cliff and Montecito, or basically the old state route, whatever it was? 225. 225. Um, so would uh, the scope of this project that we're requesting of Caltrans potentially extend to that intersection? The committee member, France, it would. And whenever we do a interchange replacement, as is being done right now at Cabrillo, um, we, we look at the entire corridor. And so we could anticipate looking at everywhere from Coda down to Montecito Street uh, and, and then including Bath. Right when you're looking at going and doing it at a wholesale interchange, we would look at that as well. Cool. Other questions? My question is, what could be permanent? I mean, with all these things that have already been tried, what on earth could finally make the difference? That's a, that's a great question, Committee Member Horn. So, uh, a, a Band-Aid fix, um, as has been done in the fa in the past. Uh, probably uh, we're, we're thinking is not going to work or not be effective um, in the long run. Uh, but if we do replace the entire structure, um, as was uh, the, the Garden Street interchange is built in the water table, the State Street inter, uh, undercrossing is built in the water table uh, with great success. There's, there's no reason that a new uh, structure would ha experience these same issues. Okay. Other questions, uh, Mr. Green? Uh, a small point. Um, I noticed in some of the literature that was distributed to the committee ahead of time that the project was from June till September, and uh, classes end, or the, the spring semester ends uh, early in May, and the fall semester, unfortunately, starts in the middle of August. So uh, if the attempt is for Caltrans to I get it done before school starts again, they're going to have to accelerate. Yeah, that's correct, and, and we may have more information about the construction uh, area uh, uh, time frame. They have in the past tried to do the, the Band-Aid fixes over the summer when school is not in session and the interchange has less vehicles and people in it, but that not, has not always uh, worked. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Rodriguez? Yeah, um, yes. Um, I'm wondering, maybe it's not feasible in your documentation of problems there. Um, you, it's all collisions. Um, what I was referring to was a pure bike accident. And um, I don't know if there's documentation of emergency vehicles, ambulance pickups over a five year period that were done at that spot um, that and it may or may not be needed, but I'm just suggesting it might be a nice thing to try and track down some of the accidents that happened to a bicyclist who picked themselves up and went home, or worse, uh, got picked up by an ambulance at the underpass, because they're not included in this. Unfortunately, that is the case, and we have some uh, anecdotal uh, experiences, like going by and actually seeing um, something and snapping a picture. But unless a police officer shows up and usually it's because someone really gets hurt, um, then a report is usually not written. So if someone just gets a scrape, they fall down and get a scrape, and, you know, and they don't call anybody, or maybe even sometimes they're calling an ambulance, and, and maybe Mr. Bailey can, can, it, can an ambulance show up and a police officer still not do a, do a report? Uh, generally, if it's a traffic-related collision that results in an injury, there is supposed to be a police collision report created, supposed to be. Um, you know, s something we struggle with, and, and Caltrans is in the same boat as well, is, is what is good traffic data. 
and there's a lot of unreported collisions that go out that that happen on, on our street network but uh, unless a police officer comes and documents what actually happened um, we, we really struggle with uh, what data we can use so we we, we rely solely on police collision data Caltrans does as well um, like Mr. Dayton said there, there's a lot of anecdotal stories and even photos and evidence but um, for the official record it's police collision reports so if uh, just hypothetically then if someone uh, was on their bicycle and crashed on their own because of the wetness no cars involved but an ambulance came to pick them up that maybe they used 911 and the ambulance came and picked them up if a policeman wasn't involved that probably wouldn't be documented anywhere for you to pick up on Am I, is that my understanding that that could happen uh in that scenario a, a police collision report should be taken um because it, if, it is yeah. possible that some of them don't happen um we we don't have a, a good way of tracking that so i'm just point of uh, yeah it's just interesting point of clarification for me that if an ambulance if someone is hurt on a bike and an ambulance is called a policeman is 99 percent of the time going to go out as well yes if the if the call is coming in through emergency services <coughs> yes then the, and then okay thanks well it's interesting for documentation thank you but i think there are i mean i can tell you because i've for many years went through there i don't anymore uh, because well one you're not supposed to um, and I and I don't take that route uh, to work anymore but um, there's so many near misses there or or people you know uh, biking is often a solo activity <laughs> where you yeah um, something happens and you get yourself together and and move on um, other questions I have we a question have public comment still mm -hmm. Um, it has to do, it mentions here that the geosynthetic sheet drain and bridge overlay are pending authorization and funding. Do you have an idea of when that would happen? Well, I think Caltrans is desiring to have it done, as it says, in, uh, two, uh, in this June. Uh, but they, the, the reason we put that in is that they still hadn't gotten authorization and the funding, emergency funding from headquarters. So. That's the process that they, the Caltrans has to go through. Thank you. And I have a follow-up. Is the Rancheria um, lane going to be in place should it begin at that point in time so that there would be an access for cyclists to get to SBCC and to the beach during that period of time? Uh, it's our intention to do that project this summer. Um, we, we do have a lot of competing interests for our funding right now. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Cycle 1 ATP projects uh, that we're going to be delivering this year. And our first priority is to make sure that we have the required local match so that we can deliver those projects. Uh, we anticipate having funding left over that we can do projects like Rancheria and Coda as well. Um, that is our first priority. But uh, as of right now, we do intend on doing both of those projects this summer, Rancheria and Coda. Thank you. Good question. Okay, um, move to public comments. So we've got Ann uh, Micah or Micah and then Joanna Kaufman. Hi, Council. Thanks so much for taking comment on this issue. Um, I'm a Santa Barbara resident, have been for uh, six years, live on the west side, and um, last April I was actually one of the statistics you're quoting. Um, I broke my pelvis in two places after um, traveling. I was going down Castillo, stopped at the light, and then once green proceeded under the underpass and my wheel got caught in one of the ruts. Um, not only is it wet, but also the pavement is really dangerous for the width of a road bicycle. Um, most of my tires slipped from behind me. I was clipped in because I was taking a ride to Ventura on the beautiful <laughs> road uh, or the path to Ventura that's here. Um, but yeah, broke my pelvis in two places, was picked up by an ambulance. Um, Greatly appreciated the quick response of um, police and ambulance, but also want to mention that when I, out of curiosity, I got the police report um, about a few weeks afterwards, and the citation or the reason why 
the accident occurred, according to the police report, was unsafe speed, which is absolutely false. The police woman did uh, ask if I picked up speed, but and I said yes because I was going down a hill, <laughs> um, and of course I was in shock after an accident and wasn't sure what happened or how it happened. So just want to also make note of that that the accidents there may not be cited for. Uh, poor pavement or lack of, uh, yeah, drainage. Um, and so, yeah, I just really encourage uh, that the pavement be repaired as quick as possible. With, since that accident, I've had literally five friends have, like, have accidents, like you mentioned, just getting abrasions and have crashed and fallen from their bicycle on that underpass. Um, and they haven't been reported to police because they carried on and um, but they could have been far worse accidents with the uh, traffic under there and just would really appreciate that being solved I do appreciate that it's uh, it's rerouted and I I still ride my bike every day to work and have a cyclist but you know having that be a, a path is really dangerous for our community and would really appreciate all you could do to make it better for our community. Thank you. Glad you're okay. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, and then uh, Sebastian Aldana, Jr. Hi. Um, I am not speaking on behalf of Coast now, so I'm speaking um, as behalf of a uh, someone who commutes by bike pretty frequently. Um, I, I'm sure staff is pretty frustrated that this problem hasn't been solved too, working with Caltrans over the years. Um, this, it, this interchange is like, when I think of places I hate to ride my bike, it's up there along with like the Fairview, Kyrial intersection. <laughs> it's just like, it's just totally nuts. Um, as the last commenter said, it's just like not only slippery, but there's huge like gaping holes in the pavement. Um, so I, I also would urge um, to really send a pressing message to Caltrans. Um, in addition, um, with Mr. Francis' question of the purview of where these improvements can be made, I would also um, suggest uh, looking at making improvements in terms of if you wanted to go straight down um, Castillo to continue forward. It just that that whole interchange there between people wanting to go right towards City College versus going straight, which Pershing's Park is, and a lot of people use that path to get up to City College to um, find a way to just make that transition um, a little safer um, because it's just, it's, it's a little hairy right now. Um, but I, I thank staff for just bringing this to the table and I hope Caltrans hears the message loud and clear. Thank you. Sebastian? And then um, Betsy Spalding, is that on this item too? Okay, great. Hello, Sebastian Aldana and Santa Barbara native, and uh, I am aware of uh, the problems of the Castillo Street. Um, on the new project, I would just hope that you would uh, put a water pump, you know, to pump up the water. I mean, <laughs> it, it, to me, it just seems like common sense. And I don't know why there wasn't one before, but I would just, maybe a water pump could be implemented. Thank you. Uh, Betsy Spaulding. Uh, yeah, I'll be quick. I just wanted to let you know that I live on the Mesa, but I use that Castillo underpass often to get home. And there are a lot of undocumented problems, accidents. I mean, I've slipped on, I think, twice, and nothing, didn't call police, you know, wasn't injured per se, but it just happens all the time because that pavement is slippery, slippery most of the time. So I think it's great to get that taken care of, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, back to the committee. Um, comments? Yeah, Mr. Green? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the recommendation or the Caltrans report document. It doesn't sound like they're doing anything to the pavers. So the problem of the gap for bicycle tires uh, may continue. 
Uh, I guess the, I'd like clarification on what we know about it. Committee member Green, my understanding of the project is that everything will get ripped up. So all the pavers that are there now get ripped up. And they're going to essentially build a new slab over what gets ripped up and leave a gap um, between so that so that any water that comes up will have will be able to sheet flow into drains that are already in place and and by the way there is a pump already there yes. um so the, so so that that's how the project is designed to work and our engineering division is concerned that um and has commented that that probably will work initially but it's such a small space for that drain the the spacing is very small that it they believe it's a matter of time before it doesn't drain anymore um and then we'll be back to the same issue without the pavers it'll be a solid slab okay. uh, the other thing is that it has to stop before the railroad bridge because there's a, a clearance issue so um, they won't be able to fix that portion but that part isn't as bad as not as bad. Yeah. Other comments? Yeah, Mr. Grant. Oh. Um, so, Mr. Dane, if I could just follow up on that. So, the the floating slab or would be for all of the lanes, but only directly under or on the sort of more northern part of the underpass, not terminating before you go on the more southerly part of the underpass where the, the UP bridge is. I believe it's from the Union Pacific Bridge uh, all the way um, to the to where the Caltrans right of way uh, ends. Um, you have a picture to show us, Mr. Brown. Is the front? Yeah, here you go. So, Chair, Chair Blackerby and members of the Commission, in terms of the project limits for this particular summer fix, uh, we looked at the construction drawings that Caltrans provided for us, their preliminary drawings, and basically this area here, uh, just to the north of Caltrans bridge deck, would be the start of the work, and that is about where the pavers uh, begin. Those, as Mr. Dayton uh, mentioned, uh, would be torn up through the extent of the underpass just to about the railroad bridge where again where the pavers end so the intent of Caltrans is to eliminate the pavers and replace that with a smooth concrete surface which um, in terms of what happened to Miss Micah and many other cyclists this is a good fix in the interim in terms of the road surface uh, but as you all are understanding the longer term uh, improvements uh, are, are what's being part of your recommendation now so if I could just follow up with that. So I'm not, I don't want to be too much of an armchair engineer here, but <laughs> just, to, just to, to break apart a couple of the problems. So, so we have water, right? But we have the cumulative effect of standing water. So we have like the algae growth. And then also that probably exacerbating the breakage of the pavers, right? Which has created the ruts and, and gaps and whatnot that obviously are even more problematic than, than water itself. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about, you know, bike lanes and just roadway design is so typically like the the lane is closest to the gutter and hence it's lower than the rest of the roadway. And um, I just I wonder if with staff's uh, attention to obviously Caltrans plan for the, the summer potential summer fix, um, any ability to play with the elevation of the bike lane so that maybe that can be slightly reversed because the whole thing needs to drain, right? So it's not like an ordinary street where you need to drain out, out of the gutters. It could drain out of the middle, theoretically. I don't know. I'm armchairing this. But I guess I would just urge any thought about any um, potential uh, shift in the, the elevation. So for example, the sidewalk is highest and there's no generally not much issue at least on the west side with water on the sidewalk. Um, and that's, you know, just eight inches higher. So if the bike lane w could be a couple inches higher, grade separation basically would be not just potentially thought to 
reflect on for a short-term fix, but also would be really interesting for long-term planning. So that's, that's my, my hope there. And then for the long-term planning, the, the transition to uh, be able to go straight on Castillo, uh, where there's the, it's sometimes free right turn onto uh, Cliff and Montecito Street. Um, that I'm sure has just a whole you know, set of issues in terms of if you need eminent domain, there's the gas station on one side, and then there's the uh, historical museum on the other, and um, but that is an issue that absolutely needs to be fixed, and it just baffles me that it, you know it's persisted this long. So, so thank you. And then maybe again, sorry, just while we have this this opportunity to comment, it would be interesting if if with any urging Caltrans could even post some signage that effectively there is a merge for right hand. Uh, for, for those who are going to be turning right, that they are merging through a bike lane. It's like a hash, a hash mark for the bike lane. Where the, where the bike lane disappears, uh, I know it can't pick up, but if there's some way to, if not a shero, but some, some way of indicating that there is a shift in the, in the bike route of travel that could be, be helpful for that uh, choke point. And you're talking about at Castillo and Montecito at that intersection. Exactly. So right. basically going up. Yeah. Lastly, I well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lastly, and, and speaking of the need to basically go up and make a very difficult, dangerous transition with traffic that is riding basically on what was until recently a state highway, um, you need to be able to maintain speed in order to be safe. And I will say uh, it is uh, pretty deflating and demoralizing the comment that Ms. Mika uh, brings up that uh, the the assigned fault is to the cyclist for unsafe speed in this type of collision. And uh, that, I mean, literally is adding insult to injury. So uh, a cyclist needs to be able to maintain speed through an undercrossing. So I don't know if, if there's any communication with PD, uh, and I understand now that that is not a, a recommended or not allowed route for cyclists, but um, that kind of message really sucks, especially if you're injured for a few months. Um, I'm not sure which direction this sign exists, but there is a sign now, and I don't know how long it's been there, that says um, dismount from your bike or something. Mm -hmm. Which, is it going toward the water Both. or the other way? Both ways. Both ways? Okay. My comment really, and this may be like dumb and dumber, but um, I think if there, I don't think, um, I know one of the p people who broke their pelvis was really oblivious to those signs and rode that underpass for years. And I guess the analogy I would draw would be to um, the, um, the nice um, pedestrian crossings down on, on um, Cabrillo Boulevard now. When you have flashing lights, you notice it. And when there's no lighting, you kind of didn't know it was there. And um, I know those signs are pretty obvious, but I think they become like wallpaper. And perhaps if there was um, a flashing light that alerted you to the dismount from your bike, this is a really dangerous place, especially for people who aren't used to bicycling through Santa Barbara. I think it, I think it would really help. Just to clarify, those dismount bicycle signs are actually very new. They were just put in in the fall. Well, okay, then um, I wasn't so that crazy. That, <laughs> if someone fell two years ago, they didn't not see the sign. The sign didn't exist. So. But, but the wavy, the sign that shows a bike with the wavy yeah. has been there One a of long my favorite time. Signs and because I don't it think anybody makes no sense. Yeah, I don't think anybody saw it, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think I think anything that's that serious, maybe flashing lights wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't know. We try, right? <laughs> Thank you. Other comments? Um, so I'll just say that, yeah, living extremely close to this and having gone through there, now looking back way too many times, what was I thinking? And I think it actually took a conversation with a couple of people, uh, including city staff, who were like, we want you to live, so please don't bike through here. Um, uh, I stopped doing it. So, um, and, and I would tell the public, as annoying as it is to either go 
the Wentworth area or even to State Street and, and up Montecito, um, you are worth it. Uh, please don't bike through there. Um, one, one question I have is the proposed summer fix from Caltrans, what does it do to the sidewalk? Do you know that part? I think it leaves the sidewalk exactly as is. Um, the sidewalk, uh, Chair Blackerby, is intended to stay as is. Um, w one of the comments that we heard from, from Committee Member France is that um, the slope and the drainage are also being considered here. And so when we met with Caltrans, um, in fact, some of the SP bike staff were there, uh, Mr. Bailey and Mr. Dayton and myself, we were told by them at that time that there would be no water on the surface of any of the lanes or the bike lane or the sidewalk. So they, their understanding and their commitment to us at that Get point. Get a recording of that? <laughs> it's, no, I do not have okay. a recording of that. I, I Always it. wear a wire when you're <laughs> meeting with Caltrans. Um, okay. All right. Well, I mean, I, I hope that's the case, and, and it's it's not, you know, we've been talking about cycling and motors. It's it's no picnic to walk on those sidewalks either. Um, it's a good way to get splashed with um, water, too. Uh, so I'm glad that that's part of it. Um, yeah, if, if you do have, I just want to say there's a little PSA. If, if you do go through there, please do report your incidents to someone, even if it's not an interaction. I understand not wanting to call 911 necessarily, but I would just say tell someone at the very least, tell the Bike Coalition uh, that, that something's happened because, you know, having some type of paper trail, even though the current system set up isn't really great for near misses or solo incidents or whatever, I think it's um, very important. Um, I'm, I'm very supportive of, well, I want to thank too the Bike Coalition for sending a very thorough, very, very thorough and long letter uh, to us as well um, about this. And I know that they've been in, in communication along with the city uh, and our assembly member's office uh, with Caltrans. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of the, the recommendations. Uh, and I, and I want to say too, you know, we deal actually at our last meeting, we dealt with um, a capital improvement um, program and project list here. Caltrans has a 10 year CIP um, the intersection fix is not on that. Uh, and so I think that's something that may, may be part of the conversation moving forward to council, but I would encourage the public to, you know, know that you have avenues to Caltrans as well. And that's something that at least if it's, it's, I mean, it's going to be very complex. It's very complex to, uh, redesign and rebuild, a freeway interchange, but at least to get on the radar, and uh, it's obviously on their radar, but on a, uh, some kind of program of projects, I think is very important. Um, so at this point, um, we'd be, if, if there's no other comments or questions, um, it would be in order to take on these recommendations. May I move to recommend the council send a letter to District 5 and headquarters requesting a permanent fixed interchange reconstruction project? That become that become a top regional priority. Second. You may. Okay. It was moved and second. Any discussion on the motion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. That's unanimous. Uh, moving to the council. Really, really thank you for that. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Could we add an asterisk to that? Or a Put your mic on. What was that? Could we add an asterisk to that or a, <laughs> some inf emphasis? <laughs> Uh, put I it in italics, will you? So to and bold. Um, and and uh, we'd also appreciate um, a heads up to the committee members when that's going to go to council. We will. We'll give you notice when it goes so that you can come and attend and support that. Thank you very much. And thank you for your, you know, I know it's it's been a bear for so long, but um, we appreciate your um, tenacity on this and trying to, to force the issue. So thank you very much. All right. Flipping over. The agenda, uh, we've got number six, car share update. Maybe some, some good news that doesn't involve broken, broken bones. And Mr. Brown, will be giving this report. Thank you, um, Chair Blackerby, members of the committee. Uh, we have an update for you on uh, the car share uh, program. We, we were last to you on this item, I believe, last year. Uh, and we are at the point now where we've signed a contract with Zipcar to provide car sharing mm -hmm. services. And we've also um, 
begun to look at locations in 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 town where uh, perhaps by middle of next month members of Zipcar could uh, rent cars. So let's talk a little bit about the program. Uh, for those who, who may not know, a reminder that uh, car sharing is a model of car rental where people rent cars for short periods of time, often by the day or hour, without dealing with anyone at the counter. Uh, it's kind of the thing where you can do it online, on your phone. Uh, you, uh, you can even call up if you don't have a smartphone. Um, and you can make all those things happen and, and check out your car. Here's what uh, one of the cars looks like. We met with Zipcar this week. They have a pretty diverse fleet. So we'll be seeking some of that fleet diversity in town. They have, uh, as you can see, two main signs that, that you'll notice around town. The Zipcar logo sign, which tells everyone that this is a Zipcar. I think their motto is Zipcars live here. Uh, and then there's also a no parking and tow away zone so that your personal vehicle uh, is not permitted to park there. <clears throat> I know Mr. Dayton uh, and many of you worked on the city's general plan and to go back to the final EIR traffic conclusions, uh, we are going to have uh, more congestion at our intersection. So this kind of looks at the number of intersections in 2008 where we experienced congestion and the projections for 2030 are for those to go up. This particular program uh, is, is part of the set of tools that we're, that were developed in order to address and mitigate anticipated traffic congestion. So um, in terms of why we do this, we're implementing Plan Santa Barbara. Uh, one of the mitigation measures was to expand the TDM program, including car share. Um, and, and the goals, of course, include decreasing uh, congestion and, and expanding uh, transportation choices. To remind us all of some of the benefits, uh, these are fairly well uh, proven in terms of data and statistics uh, nationwide and actually worldwide. Uh, but the average for Zipcar, uh, this particular program, is that 15 personal vehicles that are owned um, go away uh, per vehicle. So what Zipcar has done in cities where they exist is they've surveyed their members and they've correlated that with the number of vehicles in town. And so this is an average number. Uh, Zipcar members report a 46% increase in transit uses, usage and they drive fewer miles. So rather than taking your car for every trip because it's right in front, if you're paying by each particular use, you, you're s the idea is that you're more conscious about when you're going to use that. Uh, and in terms of car ownership, there's, there's this car shedding phenomenon that happens with car share. So, so people who have maybe a two car household are willing to go to one car uh, because they know there's another car available for that second trip. Uh, and then for cities that have implemented this, they end up freeing up parking spaces by lowering uh, parking demand as a result of the decreased vehicle ownership. These are some of your bicycle master plan uh, data analysis, but I've overlaid them with some of the zip car locations just to remind you that in downtown Santa Barbara, uh, you can see the Coda Haley Green Lane, State Street. Uh, this central area is our highest walking mode split. So 17% of folks who take their trips to work are walking. Um, and so they do not have a car with them. And their primary mode of transportation during the work week is walking. And so this is part of the candidacy of folks that may want to run an errand for an hour. Um, and so Zipcar can be appealing uh, to them. If you look at, I'm going to switch maps here to the bicycling mode split. And, and I just toggle back. It's really interesting to me that the center block is the walking highest split. And then when you go around and away from that, the trips are a little further, and that just happens to be where the bicycle becomes the primary tool. So your trip is a little longer. The bike then uh, becomes the tool of, of preference. And, and also, you can't see it very well. I have some other maps. But what I've done is I've thrown in the Zs uh, for the zip car locations that we've identified. We've worked with them uh, and, and a good team effort um, in the transportation division to find out uh, where we anticipate zip cars uh, demand to be the highest. These will likely be our initial locations. Uh, this is another way to look at the same data using our average unit density uh, map that talks about where the city, again, per the general plan, is looking to increase uh, infill housing in the downtown. 
Again, this is one of the primary locations uh, in town where we believe that car sharing services can be most beneficial. Uh, as a reminder to the Transportation uh, Committee, within this particular ordinance, parking requirements are reduced. It's one space per unit. So this is exactly the type of resident that we believe would be ripe for uh, Zipcar uh, membership. Uh, real briefly, I'll just run through these locations. We're looking at uh, Gutierrez and Milpas, uh, Ortega Lot or Lot 10, the Granada Garage, uh, Garage or Lot 6. Um, this is probably two cars initially at the Amtrak Depot, uh, Lot 13 for parking advocates. Uh, this is an existing location, this if I can find my mouse here, uh, at the Santa Barbara City College. There's two cars there that are well used uh, according to Zipcar. Uh, and then some of our on-street locations, uh, if I can make this mouse appear for me, there it is. So we're looking at De La Guerra and De La Vina, next to the MTD Transit Center at Figueroa and Chapala. Uh, Sola and De La Vina is right about here. Uh, one west side location at San Andres and Mitchell Terena. And then we've had a lot of requests for up at Cottage Hospital, uh, which is that upper upper area. Um, so <coughs> again, I just have a, one or two more slides. This is another photo. Uh, again, you can kind of see uh, this particular city, ha like ours, has some historic buildings uh, and the Zipcar uh, locations are nonetheless there. And at this time, I'll take any uh, questions or comments from your committee. Okay, any questions? Um, and we have one um, public comment vote. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair Blackerby. Mr. Brown, uh, my first question is, how many cars are coming at first and then maybe after? Yeah, so uh, <coughs> Committee Member France, the number is probably 11. Uh, we still haven't finalized that. We have another meeting with Zipcar next week. We're looking at that 10 to 12 car range. The nice thing about Zipcar is they're a very nimble organization. They have a headquarters in Los Angeles. They have significant fleet. And they also have good standards for how often they want their cars to go out during the day. So what we're looking to do is analyze the data for usage in the first three to six months, which is like I think their standard practice. And we may make adjustments. I if demand is really high in certain locations, we may add cars. Uh, if we find a location that's less successful, uh, Zipcar may want to take that car away. So uh, that's the starting point. We, we also were recommended by Zipcar to uh, start a little lower uh, in that kind of 8 to 12 car number um, such that the community becomes more aware of the service and there's a buildup for it. Um, they've had experiences in other cities where they've gone too big too soon um, and had to pull back uh, a significant number of cars. So. Mr. Rodriguez? Yeah. Um, did I misunderstand you? I thought you said that you already have two cars at City College. We do, but that's not on city property. That's at the City College property. Oh, so sorry. the program that we're working on now I and through the city ordinance is to allow a zip car to operate on city-owned right-of-way. So um, there could be other entities that could uh, contract with these folks? like City College did? I mean, is that a separate arrangement? So if UCSB wanted to? They do as well. Just oh, to clarify, it's not on City College property, I believe. It's on it's at the housing complex next door. Private property then. It's not on City right, right of way. Right, so, I know. I'm but just saying there are it's not, the, the college didn't, you know. Didn't do it. Didn't they they can, though. UCSB has it. Isla Vista has it. Westmont College, the airport. Um, this particular effort here is City right of way. Oh, it shows how I haven't noticed that they're out there. So this is terrific. Now you'll see them. I now will you'll now notice. notice them. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Questions? Yeah, I um, have a couple questions. One is how much does it cost? And is there like, like a monthly fee or, a, you know, just a usage fee? How does that work? Uh, that's a good question, uh, Committee Member Horn. The way that it works is uh, members of Zipcar have two options to become members. You can do a monthly membership, which is $10, uh, a fairly nominal fee. The annual membership is $70. So if you're pretty sure you're going to be using it regularly, you're going to go for the annual membership. And then the hourly usage is between $8 and $15 an hour. 
And of course, that the unique thing about that price is that includes your fuel, your insurance, um, everything is, is included in that cost. So uh, there's some convenience there to the user. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I also wondered if I, I can picture taking a bike ride to one of these locations and then using the, the zip car. And I'm wondering if there's any any possibility of getting car uh, bike parking at some of these places at the locations. There is that possibility. Uh, there's also something that's quite common in other areas is bike racks that are uh, in the trunk of the car and can be easily mounted. Uh, there's also larger vehicles. There's mid-size SUVs. You can throw your bike inside. Um, these are all um, options. And as the program comes to life, we will uh, be willing to uh, put in, at least in the areas that we have influence, bike parking as needed. Okay, okay. great. Other questions? Yeah, Mr. Green. Um, I appreciate the, the three maps that you supplied. Unfortunately, the yellow background for the Z is very hard to pick up uh, on the maps. I would hope that as this continues, that you'll supply something with no overlays other than the Zipcar locations. Maybe things like the transit terminal and, and uh, uh, public buildings, but not where the not the overlays like you have. Thank you. Easy to do. Great. Another question? Just mm -hmm. one more thing. Are all of these the trips, the usage, uh, expected to be a round trip away and back to the same spot? That is the model, uh, Committee Member Horn, that we're looking at now. Uh, Zipcar has some pilot programs where they're doing one-way uh, trips. We're not going to have that available in Santa Barbara at the beginning, uh, but that is something that if the program is successful uh, that I've already spoken with Zipcar about, it's something they're willing to explore. In some locations, there's a lot of Zipcar parking at LAX, and there's one-way trips, and it's kind of like the gold mine for going to LAX. You're not paying for parking, but you can pick up a new car and bring it back um, to your town. The thing about those locations that are having that one-way interaction is they have abundant spaces designated, as you can imagine, in their communities. Um, we're at the point now where we're doing uh, spot locations, and so we're very nascent stages of, of our parking allocation. Great. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess once it, for clarification, the, you're talking specifically about the city project. The other projects in Santa Barbara, are they all round trips as well since we have such a small geography? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go to public comment. I have two speaker slips, one Cameron Gray, and then Joey Juhasz Lakomsky. Wow. I did it. Good <laughs> evening again, Chair Blackerby and Commission members. Uh, my name is Cameron Gray, speaking on behalf of Community Environmental Council. Uh, this is something to celebrate. We have been advocating for car share for about half a decade, <laughs> and we are incredibly excited to see that it has arrived here in Santa Barbara. Um, we understand that there were some contracting challenges with bringing it here, so we commend staff for working with Zipcar to find solutions to those issues. It sounds like they did some heavy lifting. Um, I won't belabor the benefits of Zipcar further. I think staff did a really good job of highlighting what those benefits are. Uh, it will help us kind of develop our community in a climate smart way, and Zipcar's arrival here will be timely, especially with the concerns about parking impacts from more high density developments coming online uh, through the average unit size density program. We're very pleased with the proposed locations. They are clustered around AUD, as you heard, um, which is fantastic. We're also glad to know that there are two zip cars being proposed for the Amtrak depot. So it's kind of like a, a transit oriented deployment of the service there. Um, let's see. So yeah, really just, uh, also want to highlight the potential opportunity for maybe subsidizing some of the costs uh, through creative kind of roll-in or connection of the AUD program and car share. I believe Zipcar is paying the city for the parking spaces that they are provided. So maybe developers could be um, encouraged. There could be some incentives put in place where, and if they put Zipcar at a given location and they subsidize it, they get some kind of benefit that would help kind of pair the, the car share services with the AUD development specifically, 
something to explore. And uh, also transportation equity. So uh, as you heard, Zipcar is cheaper than owning and operating an automobile. So uh, in the future, if Zipcar is able to be scaled, it's successful, maybe we can explore putting them in some lower income neighborhoods. There may be some state programs that can help do that, especially with a recent piece of legislation that's gonna go into effect hopefully soon here, which is AB 1550. That was passed by the legislature uh, and it may open some doors for more funding coming to uh, subsidized projects for transportation that benefit low-income households. So uh, with that, I just want to, again, thank staff. Thank you all for making this happen. Uh, we're excited to work with Zipcar to make sure that the program can succeed and grow. Thanks. All right. Joey? Uh, Joey again, speaking on my own behalf. Um, just want to say that this, I... Uh, don't own a car i just ride my bike around town there are um, occasions that give me pause as to not owning a car where i kind of wish i had one uh, i think this is a great way to chip away at some of the affordability uh, issues here in santa barbara um, but only if it's affordable i heard a, a scale at eight to fifteen dollars uh, per hour it would be great to see zipcar introduced at, at as low a rate as possible i think just to get people uh, sort of into the concept and also kind of echoing what Cameron said just about accessibility um, wherever they might end up in whatever neighborhood so but I think it's I think it's great so thank you okay um, so comments or any other questions Mr. Green? thank you um, I, I am pleased that this effort is going on and that the city has uh, dedicated uh, parking space uh, for this. Uh, I also don't own a car, use public transit and walking. Um, I'm too old to bike, but uh, never, too old. never too old. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are other uh, rental options that people who may be interested in this program should explore and um, there is a downtown location, for instance, at, uh, Ch on Chapala over here at Coda. Uh, I won't mention any names of companies, but uh, locations uh, also exist um, uh, near Five Points for a different company. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Comments, questions? I have, I have another Grants? sort of comment question. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Dayton, I guess my, my question is really the scope of this program is to carve out on street right of way or a city facility, maybe I think the Granada Garage, uh, in order to facilitate um, a, a car share program with kind of a clear visibility, its own space to help facilitate, you know, a, to attract a company to come into town. But short of uh, there are no subsidies. In fact, as I understand it, there's actually, you know, the companies will be charged for the use of the on-street space for the facilities. Um, and so that is that is one kind of question because I think, uh, and, and actually you all probably know better than I, uh, you know, UCSB and Isla Vista through the county and the past redevelopment agency subsidized uh, Zipcar, I believe Zipcar, um, going back, yeah, like 10 years ago. I think Santa Barbara City College is going back either one or two years in the facility in the, um, the apartment building across the street from it, probably attracted them with some subsidy. Could you just elaborate on um, where we are and the advantage of where we are and ma maybe any disadvantage of where we are? Uh, absolutely. So committee member France, um, we, we, Zipcar approached us um, perhaps a decade ago now and wanted us to wanted to be on the street, uh, wanted to be in various public facilities, but then they wanted us to subsidize that. And at that time, uh, we didn't do that program. We didn't have the funds to subsidize. Uh, there was a great risk. Um, car share was not um, avant-garde as now. And, and that's all changed. Now they're very willing to give us $160 per month um, per space. Um, and they also, as Mr. Brown mentioned, have joined with a rental car agency, I forget, is it Avis? 
think it's Avis. Um, so Avis owns them, and so their ability to scale uh, is very uh, it's very nimble, as Mr. Brown pointed out. Uh, so we don't anticipate any need to subsidize this. One uh, commenter brought up about having a specific AUD be able to have Zipcar on site, and, and they can they can do that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make it a public, a very public um, service that works very well, and it provides just another another tool in our transportation uh, suite of of strategies to reduce congestion and to uh, alleviate on-street parking demand, uh, and in the shared commodity, uh, shared economy, which is really ramping up, we see car, car share ex succeeding, and we see Zipcar as uh, we had two proposals um, in response to our request for proposals, uh, and we see Zipcar as being a shining star and and um, being the one that's going to really succeed. So in terms of subsidies, we don't feel that there's a need. And right now in public works, we have a huge deficit for road funding as it is. So there wouldn't be any room to subsidize. Um, and if, and if, a, if a private owner or an AUD wanted to subsidize it, that, you know, that's, they're welcome to do that. All right. Uh, to follow up, so, so obviously making the space available and going through the legal rigmarole to make that happen uh, was necessary to uh, to attract a, a vendor and at, with you know a baseline of, of cars. Um, if they're nimble and ready, is the city. If we need to add ten more parking spaces, two months from now. <coughs> oh, abs absolutely. If the, if we see this, if, you know, if this is like AUD. Um, <laughs> Maybe we should cap it and then. No, I, we, you know, if this is successful, as, as Mr. Brown pointed out, which is a critical point to this program, is that this will save parking spaces. Yeah. So, so every, per, every zip car that's successful, which means profitable, the only reason it's going to stay there is it's successful. Otherwise, it's going to be moved. If 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 a, a zip car is in your neighborhood and your neighborhood is parked out, you want it there because that means that many neighbors are are using that spot and not parking mm -hmm. um, in in other spots. So, uh, and we'll we'll try to as we as we roll this out, explain that in our public process. But it, we have every intention if Zipcar sees a success and, and sees another place we can put it. To do that because it will only help people who are struggling with parking and and ultimately uh, hopefully congestion as well thank you Great. Great. Um, can you give us an idea of what the marketing will be chair blackerby committee member horn uh, the um, zip car has assigned uh, a full-time uh, uh, marketing person to, to the Santa Barbara launch. Um, they also have a public relations person who's been assigned to Santa Barbara. Uh, we are working with them to do a water bill utility mailer that's going to go out in May. So every resident in Santa Barbara that gets that bill is going to, if they take a look at that flyer, know about Zipcar uh, being in town. Uh, there's a ribbon cutting that we're looking at doing uh, that'll happen uh, probably uh, April 18th, 17th, 18th, somewhere around there. The date's not set, uh, but we'll let you know when it is. Uh, we also have, uh, w we're working with local media uh, to do a few stories. There's going to be several press releases. Uh, and I, this has all been taking off here in the last week or two. And I can say that uh, you probably will be impressed with how much news there is about uh, this program coming to town. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Dayton alluded to, the real success of the program is going to come down to the amount of hours a car goes out every day. So, you know, because Zipcar is, is leasing space from the city, uh, they want to see the cars go out as much as possible. So in order for that to happen, uh, Santa Barbara residents and visitors are going to have to become Zipcar members if they want to use the vehicles. Uh, and then not only that, they're going to have to uh, rent the cars. 
So um, it's, it's to the program success uh, that people become aware of the program. So if you all have an opportunity to share this news, please do. Uh, but I think we have a pretty good media strategy and, and marketing campaign together. Uh, I'm also, I've also been asked by Zipcar to partner with um, the downtown organization, um, their website, their newsletter. Um, the Community Environmental Council has already agreed to do um, some uh, e email blasts or newsletter. Um, I've contacted uh, MTD, SB Car Free. Uh, <coughs> Zipcar will be looking at all of these uh, websites as well as the city's downtown parking website, the city's front page, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We've got it all. <laughs> uh, so it'll be out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Green? So just to clarify again, maybe I, I didn't hear it. Uh, how soon are we hoping for this? We are hoping that by that ribbon cutting day of around April 18th, that the initial 10 cars will be on the ground and ready to be leased. Just in time for Earth Day. That's right. And we also have talked to Zipcar about coming to Earth Day and having a show there. They're going to participate in the Green Car Show. Uh, they're looking to have a tent and a booth. So any, any attendee of Earth Day will most likely pass by and become aware of the Zipcar presence. Nice. Cool. Um, Thank you. A few, a few more questions. The, the um, spaces. Are we thinking there'll just be a sign? Will the pavement be marked in a particular way, um, or will it just be the sign? That's to be determined. Uh, we, we are looking to designate um, the ground with the Zipcar logo and maybe a green box around it. Um, zip cars live here. We think that's kind of a nice way so that even when the car's not there. A passerby can tell, A, that that's where zip cars park only, but um, to kind of catch the passerby's attention, whether they're biking, walking, or driving, uh, the presence of the car. Um, ag again, we have to be a little careful with the initial uh, launch in terms of how much paint and signage we put up um, in the case that we do some tweaking in the initial three- to six-month period. Great. Yeah, I hope they really stick out um, personally. Um, and then the, I guess the, the other thing is um, functionally, you know, obviously the car is going to be returned back, but uh, are the, the specific cars, I know that the, they come and they come and fuel them and everything, but do, do we think that the, the different types of vehicles will be moved around town to see how it goes or how does that work? The way, the way that works is the user fuels the vehicle through a fuel card that is in okay. the visor. And so um, just like when you rent a car, you know, you typically return it uh, full. Um, that obviously is included in your price. That's why Zipcar, ha Zipcar company has a fuel car there. Um, in terms of the fleet mix, in speaking with the fleet manager uh, this week, uh, we're looking at probably three or four hybrid vehicles, um, maybe some uh, wagon-type vehicles. Uh, Mazda Impreza was one of the um, vehicles that he mentioned. That's an all-wheel drive vehicle. Maybe even a mid-size um, SUV, like a, CR, a Honda CRV. They, they, they have a dynamic fleet, right. uh, and we are looking um, to have a mixture, and those will be located in different parts around town. If there's demand, again, we have the flexibility of moving cars around. Um, and to go back to one of the early uh, public comments on this item, the range really is the $8 to $15 range is about the vehicle. It's about the size of the vehicle and the capacity of the vehicle and the features of the vehicle. So I if you're just looking for basic get around in a compact car, that's going to be in that kind of $8 range. The higher end vehicles can go up from there. Great. Um, and then I would, I would just say, you know, we've talked about AUD, and I totally get why. The initial ones are in the downtown core um, and as far out as Oak Park. Um, if, if it's not demanded uh, by council, I would say uh, if if the twelfth car that comes in isn't in the Lacumbra upper state area, um, we're doing it wrong. So I would I would just imagine that <laughs> that would be the next good place if you look at the overlays um, to have at least one over there. Um, with uh, you know new rentals coming online, so I'm assuming that's in the that's in the forecast if if things go well. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. Well, do let us know about that ribbon cutting as well. <laughs> Tell us about all ribbon ribbons cut, uh, Mr. Green. Um, I went ahead and 
got the card. Uh, it's about a one-week process, so don't um, expect to get okay. uh, the okay. card the next day. Okay. Uh, they mail the card to you, and you have to supply some proofs to them also. Okay, so start, start ordering now. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you. Also good to see this come to fruition. Okay, number seven is the election of chair and vice chair. Uh, though it is March, um, it's time <laughs> for our new, uh, we generally do this election every year um, for chair and vice chair. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, and it's to the committee. Who wants it? You got it. I'm going to nominate Hillary again for chairman for next year. Second. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there discussion? I would like to discuss this. Um, I am not uh, holding on, gra uh, you know, I do not have a tight grasp on this power of being chair of the TCC, I will tell you. Um, I was chair several years ago and then this happened again where they kept me on for a second year and then I had a reprieve of a year and then there was a lot of <laughs> not me going on on the committee. Um, so I will tell you that if, if anyone else is interested, don't be um, scared to self-nominate and I will second that nomination if, uh, if you do it. Um, I I want to be clear that I think it's important that we I mean we're as you can see we're short a member so we actually yeah. um, in the next round of um, applications for this committee we'll have you know we'll have another vacancy and so I would encourage members of the public um, hopefully some of the people who were here earlier to one apply for the committee and then two we need people who um, who get on the committee to step up to take um, leadership roles of chair and vice chair. So um, is there any other? Yes. I'll be happy to be vice chair again. Okay. If you're not okay. here, I'll take Second. over. Um, well, why don't we, since there is a motion on the floor um, for chair, <clears throat> I guess deal with that first. But is there any other discussion or any other substitute motions? <laughs> Maybe. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I guess on that um, motion for chair, uh, being motion seconded, moved and seconded, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'll abstain <laughs> out of just m modesty. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone. Uh, vice chair, uh, I would nominate uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second for that? Second. Okay, Mr. Franz seconds. Um, any discussion on that? Any other interest? Okay, I'm looking to our, our new person to say, get on deck <laughs> for next, well, I, I we, for next year. To us, uh, at, at my first meeting. So Fair enough, I'm just saying. <laughs> look towards the future. That's right. Um, next year. <laughs> for, for either of those spots. Um, okay, so all those in favor of electing Ms. Rodriguez Vice Chair, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Uh, well, we shall continue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, with that, if there's not anything else, um, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. So easy to